I'm going to introduce the next two speakers. I'm going to start with Dr. Ellen Bogan. He's professor and chair and a Theodore Roberts Endowed Chair in Pediatric Neurosurgery. He's a chief of neurosurgery at Harborview Medical Center where I work and the chief of neurosurgery at Children's here in Seattle. He's also an adjunct professor in radiology at the UW School of Medicine. His clinical practice focuses on pediatric and adult brain tumors, craniofacial anomalies, Chiari malformations, trauma, minimally invasive brain surgery, and spine surgery. He received his medical de degree from Brown University in 1983, and after completing his residency at Children's Hospital, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, the Harvard Medical School, Dr. Ellen Bogan then became Chief of Pediatric Neurosurgery and Director of the Surgical Epilepsy Program at Walter Reed in Washington, D.C. After Dr. Ellen Bogan, we'll have Dr. Uh, Richard Satava. He's a professor of surgery and the senior executive advisor in the Institute for Surgical and Inter Interventional Stim Simulation at the UW School of Medicine. He's also a special assistant in advanced technologies at the US Army Medical Research and Material Command in Fort Detrick, Maryland. Prior to coming to the UW, he was a professor of surgery at Yale and had a military appointment as professor in the Army Medical Corps assigned to general surgery at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. During 20 years of military surgery, he's been an active flight surgeon, an Army astronaut candidate, a mass surgeon for the Granada invasion, and a hospital commander during Desert Storm, all while continuing his surgical practice. While striving to practice complete discipline of surgery, he is aggressively pursuing the leading edge of advanced technologies to formulate the architecture for the next generation of medicine. This includes surgery in the space environment, video and 3D imaging, telepresence surgery, and virtual reality surgery simulation. His undergraduate training was at Johns Hopkins, medical school at Hanneman University in Philadelphia, internship at Cleveland Clinic, surgical residency at the Mayo Clinic, and a fellowship with a master's in surgical research at the Mayo Clinic. So let's start with a nice welcome for Dr. Ellen Bogan. Dr. Thank you very much. Well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about innovation in surgery. And Rick and I, tag team. We were in the Army together, and we're now at the University of Washington together. Figure that. And he's going to talk about the future. I'm going to talk a little bit about the future, but some of the amazing things that are going on right now. Now, you first got to understand where we're coming from. Um, when we think, when we talk about innovation, remember, turn of the century, and I'm talking about turn of the 20th century, back in the 1900s, what was happening? Well, medical care was delivered basically by doctors coming to your home. <laughs> you know that doesn't happen anymore. Um, I, in fact, my mother-in-law talks about it on her South Dakota farm being operated on the kitchen table. She did perfectly, by the way. She's still my mother-in-law. And uh, there, of course, is a picture. What killed most people at the turn of the century was a poor water supply, poor food supply, and the fact that infectious disease was rampant. And of course, Walter Reed, right over here, Walter Reed, Sir Walter, right over there, Walter Reed, Major Walter Reed, um, he was famous for conquering yellow fever and letting the Panama Canal be built. People didn't even know what caused yellow fever at that time. So in the turn of the 20th century, 1900s, man and women lived about 49 years, not much. Keep that in mind, because when I conclude, I'll tell you how we're doing now. So I'm going to talk about three advances in surgery. Three big advances, minimally invasive, non-invasive, 
And in that realm, neuroradiology, radiology has really been revolutionizing what I do for a living. Nanotechnology, that's a real buzzword these days, but it's real science. And it's, uh, and it's science that is changing the way we practice medicine. And the last thing that you probably have not heard a lot about, but is going to be coming up in the next 10 years, is the computers, robotics, and the brain-computer interface. So we're going to cover all that. Now, let's talk a little bit about innovation. This is how I see innovation, and I, and I have to thank uh, one of my colleagues, the chairman of bioengineering, Youngman Kim. You know, most of our innovative ideas, where do they end up in what uh, Kim, Dr. Kim calls the valley of death? 99% of all great ideas never get to you. They just don't. Everybody thinks of wonderful things. They discover them, but first you put out a case report. No one believes you. They say you're lying. Then you do a series of cases or patients, and you, you publish it, and people are really suspect. And once we start using some great new innovation, like cardiac cath, all of a sudden it became my idea. Everybody had the idea. That's how innovation works. And as long as you're OK with somebody else taking the credit, then you can be very innovative. <laughs> now, here's an example. Most people put diplomas on the wall. These are the kind of things I put all my failures on the wall because it humbles me and it's really from failure, failure that innovation comes. This is, I came up with this great new idea for a new operation for very deep-seated tumors and I tried to get it published back in the late 1980s, early 1990s and this is what the editor said. This represents the single most dangerous surgical approach this editor's reviewers have ever seen. It should be mentioned in the literature only to be condemned for the single-minded and insanity <laughs> it brings to this field. Now you can imagine, I'm a young neurosurgeon, right out of training. It's very encouraging, isn't it? <laughs> Once you, it makes you want to innovate some more, right? Well, I didn't get discouraged. I, I kind of laughed. I framed it on my wall to come up with new ideas. And I'm going to show you the, the idea that I, that I came up with, although small and tiny, is now the way we practice for these particular types of tumor, despite the bad, uh, bad reviews. And the way we get across this valley of death, because that idea was going right in the valley of death with my hundred other great ideas, okay, 99 of them stayed in the valley of death, but the way we get them uh, across across that kind of bridge is basically through translational research, through grants, by getting grants from NIH, getting grants from private foundations. It might be from industry, it might be from families that are affected by the disease, but never think for a second that that money doesn't change the world and encourage and make possible innovation. And of course you have to have good friends and family to go to who tell you you're really not as stupid as you think you are. And what happens, as I said, you collaborate with experts. The way science, at least the way we do science now, is we're collaborating with experts all across this medical school. It's the only way we can push innovation forward. And it's got to be supported by private donations or industry. And then you can let everybody else claim it was their idea, the best idea I never had. You know, that sort of thing. So think about a hundred years ago, the way we looked, the way my predecessors looked inside the skull. In fact, this is a kid's brain, okay? And we show, this is the technology at the time. When I first started, we took flashlights to kids' heads. That's how we looked inside them. Pretty fancy, huh? Of course, think about how we do it now. I don't do a brain tumor operation. Don't do one without a computer, and an MRI guided navigation center. So here's a tumor inside somebody's brain. Here you see it, okay? And I could sure take off the whole skull and try to feel my way through the brain, but you know, most of the brain's really important. It actually does things. So I'm gonna take a trajectory that's the shortest trajectory through the brain. It's all done through computers, and just like the pilots that land 747s in the middle of the night in the dark, it is navigation. And this is an example, here's another example of how we use computers and imaging to try to figure out what to do. This is a child born with a disease called Klebelschattel, so a cloverleaf skull. All the growth plates in his skull have closed, and his brain is being squished. This is his brain coming out here. He has nowhere to go. He will die if this is not treated. 
You can see him next to his normal brother, but it takes, as I said, it takes collaboration. The only way innovation and research get done, you need in what I do in surgery, I need a multidisciplinary surgery team. Thank God at Children's Hospital where I do this surgery, I've had, I have the best, one of the best teams in the country, ophthalmologists, maxillofacial surgeons, plastic surgeons that can take a kid like this who will die a terrible death and we use three, in radiology, use three-dimensional rendering of their brain and their skull. You can see the skull is just eaten away by the pressure, the increased pressure. This looks like Swiss cheese, the skull. And then we take apart the skull and the orbits and reconstruct their skull and brain so that they look like that again. This is not a cosmetic operation. This is for brain salvation. So it's that that radiology that's changed what we did. This is just one example of how we do it. Now here, here's another example of how radiology and non-invasive imaging, the ability to look inside the brain, just like Fantastic Voyage, without opening up the skull, changes what we did. Here's an example of an aneurysm. Here are vessels in the brain. Okay? These are all normal vessels in the brain, except here is an aneurysm, which is a weakness of one of the vessels. And when they burst, a third of the people, you probably, how many people knew who, who had a ruptured vessel in their brain? Anybody? Probably everybody, because stroke is the number two killer in this country after heart disease. Okay? A third of the people will never make it to the hospital. They die in their sleep. A third of the people come in and do okay because they get to a hospital like Harborview, which is one of the you know, best trauma centers in the world. It's also one of the best neurosurgical centers where they, they can get a patient like that into the operating room in 20 minutes. Okay? But a third of the patients will be devastated, will live, but be devastated, and all because of this. So now what do we do? So you'll see, we're able to look inside, just like Fantastic Voids. We know how to get there. Now, normally, we clip these aneurysms. We open up the skull, and we have to retract the brain and go in there. But now, with these 3D renderings, we use catheters. And when I say we, the neurovascular surgeons and the radiologists at Harborview, will use catheters to get in there. And 60% of all aneurysms now at our hospitals at the University of Washington are not treated with surgery. They're treated with endovascular therapy, this kind of therapy. Here you go, a catheter going in. Now the stent is being placed, and look at this, coils. It looks like cheese whiz, doesn't it? But it's actually platinum coils blocking out that aneurysm. Patient goes home the next day instead of two weeks in the hospital. Here's another, here's another example. Stroke. Remember I said number two cause of death and disability in this country after heart disease. There's a blood clot in a cerebral vessel, in a vessel in the brain. People come in, weak on one side, can't speak. They're in the operating room in hours. Within four hours in the operating room, and they're getting the clot pulled out of their brain, suctioned away, disappears, they wake up and they can talk and move their arms. That's a very extreme example, but that happens all the time. Here is an arteriosclerotic plaque right here, arteriosclerotic plaque. And he here you go, just like in the coronary vessels, the interventional radiologists and nurse surgeons are able to put in stents and let the blood and oxygen flow. You'll see in a second the stent will be exploded up and push out the plaque. There you go. And this all done in a matter of minutes or hours is the difference between talking and not talking, moving and not moving. It's quite dramatic when it happens in the operating room. Minimally invasive surgery. Probably 50 operations a year. In fact, th tomorrow, or no, Thursday at Harborview, I'll be doing a minimally invasive surgery, taking a big brain tumor out through a little endoscope the size of a pen. Instead of, the, I offered the patient a big operation where it can go through a lot of brain or a little operation through a little endoscope. And here's an example. Here's the size of the endoscope compared to the brain. And here's the big brain tumor. So it's sitting. Remember I talked to you about this idea of doing this? And, of course, the editors about 20 years ago thought this was a really nutty idea. 
And, and now it's standard practice. And here is the pineal region tumor, and I'll give you an example of what it looks like. So now we're in fantastic voyage. Get yourself back into fantastic, we're in the brain. We're floating in the fluid in the brain, just like Raquel Welch did with Donald Pleasance, okay? I mean, I'm doing the same thing, man. I am living large back in 1966. And so the first thing I do is I take a balloon, and I'm pushing that balloon right through the floor of the brain so I can release the fluid that's built up. This patient is dying from the increased fluid in their brain. And so I put this balloon in, and look at this. I'm right in the brainstem. I am in the most important part of the brain. Every, the controls respiration. Look at that big artery. That's the basilar artery. That's the major artery to the brain that's feeding the brainstem. And I'm just taking a look at it. And there's the big tumor there. And now I'm going to take a shot at that. And I'll just show you a little of that. Uh, I start, it's fairly large. And I just start by taking a piece of that tumor. And you can see. And that, and that is minimally invasive brain surgery. Revolutionized the way we think about neurosurgery. OK? Now I want to take a little break from minimally invasive brain surgery, talk a little bit about nanotechnology. Now, I want to just show you nanotechnology and tumors. This is, again, about brain tumors. Well, the thought is, in order to see a brain tumor even better than that at the molecular level, you really, it's not something a neurosurgeon can do by himself. It takes people like Jim Olson, who's a molecular biologist and an oncologist, Michin Sang, works in our engineering department here, who is in the division in nanotechnology. These are also engineers, the two, and here's a radiologist. And what we want to do is, if you look at the brain, and you look at a brain tumor, you can't tell the difference a lot of time. It's not labeled. When we open up the skull, and we open up the covering of the brain, the dura mater, which in Latin means tough mother. It's very tough. It's like leather. And you can't tell the brain from the, from the brain tumor. And that's the problem, because you want to leave the brain behind, and you want to take the brain tumor out, right? So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to develop technologies, nanotechnology, and I'll explain why, that will paint the tumor so the neurosurgeon can know the difference between the two. And it's going to be highly sensitive, highly selective, and this is the way it works. You start with a magnetic or a nanoparticle that will light up. You, you attach it to something, and then you attach it to a fluorescent probe, and you make an agent that, believe it or not, is so small, that's why it's nanotechnology, it can get through the bloodstream. It can also get through the blood-brain barrier, which is a barrier that prevents chemotherapy from getting from the blood to the brain. Gets inside there. And just give you an example, it gets taken up by the brain tumor. And then you look under a special microscope, and here's an example of what happens. Now, once again, I want to reiterate, these are mice. These are not happy mice. They don't, they're not happy because they have brain tumors. And here they are. They light up. And we are able to differentiate the normal brain from the brain tumor and just take out that which, and this will be coming in the next five or 10 years, the people like Olson and Zhang will be able to help us refine our craft even more. Now, let's talk a little bit about what, what I said, the last thing, robotics and the brain computer interface. This is fascinating, what's happening here. One of the most important advances that is really going to change the way I think the way we're practicing medicine is this thing called neuromodulation. Now, neuromodulation is basically the ability to stimulate parts of the nervous system and change what that does. Years ago, if you had pain, we said cut the nerve. If you had a problem, we said ablate it or destroy it. Now we're saying don't do that, restore it get it back to normal, stimulate it, okay? In the next 10 years, you're going to see tripling, quadrupling of these sort of operations. Spinal cord stimulators for chronic intractable pain. We do it now. Peripheral nerve st stimulators, cranial nerve stimulators, deep brain stimulation, pumps, stem cell and gene therapy. These are the sort of pumps we put, and I'm going to give you an example. Neuromodulation is very easy to deliver. It's rapid, it's precise, you can turn it on, you can turn it off, it's reversible. 
You can do it in the brain, you can do it in the spinal cord. Now, right now, the FDA approves it for treatment of Parkinson's disease, treatment of tremor, dystonia, which is un unusual movements of the arm. What we're looking at right now, and there's very promising work on epilepsy, there's a, I'm gonna show you an NIH study uh, being done right now on depression. Can you imagine for people with intractable depression, medications don't work, psychotherapy, electroshock doesn't work. There might be a surgical treatment for depression. This is my favorite, obesity. Can't wait for that to come out, okay? You don't need a bypass, you can stimulate something in the brain. Addictions, anxiety disorders, and I'm gonna give you some examples. Ali Rezaia is a good friend, good colleague of mine at the Cleveland Clinic who ran the NIH study on both depression and obesity. So here's an activation. This is a young man. Can you imagine you're 35 years old and you have terrible tremors? Part See that right side just relax right away? They're turning on the deep See brain that left stimulation. Side just... So you saw those terrible movements. It's like a new man. They turn him on and look what it does. He has deep brain stimulation. What he has is electrodes in his brain in his thalamus. And you saw that terrible dystonia. Okay, and I'll go back again just to, to see. So here are the deep brain, here are the, 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 this is deep in the brain in the thalamus, these electrodes that are implanted. And the generator is right here under the skin. And what that gentleman was doing was turning him on. Take a look at the terrible deformity that he has and what happens, again, when you activate the deep brain stimulators. All he's doing is turning on, look at the terrible Parkinson's and See that right areas. side just relax right away? You can see that left side just... <sighs> Pretty like dramatic, a huh? It's like a different person. And now I'm going to show you another thing. Dr. Rezai had, has this beautiful study going on from NIH on depression. And um, this is a woman that has absolutely intractable. Let me know if you feel anything different. Intractable here. depression. Cannot be cured of her depression. Okay. No so right now. Okay. You'll see in a second. I feel okay. Feel pretty good. So they're turning on the electricity before. into our brain. More of the same. A little better. What are you feeling? They're turning Happy. it up. Happy? Yeah, I feel good. <laughs> I just feel really good now. What? I like to smile. You want to smile? She hasn't yeah. smiled in 10 years. You know I haven't this? smiled for a long time. Yes. Smiling again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can imagine someone who is that morbidly depressed. What do you feel like now? I feel pretty good. <laughs> Where would your mood be now? Uh, seven was before. Yeah, well, maybe eight. About the eight. same? Okay. Nine, I feel nine, pretty nine, good. Nine, <laughs> 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 kind of laughing, huh? <laughs> <laughs> what are you thinking of right now? Why, why are you laughing for? Because yeah, I feel so good right now. I don't feel like before. Where's your mood at right now? I would say it's back to five. They turned off the stimulator. <laughs> yeah, I'm turning it back on. What are you feeling, Karen? <laughs> That's deep brain stimulation. And it's an unbelievable thing if you see somebody crippled by Parkinson's disease, depression, to be able to stimulate, instead of ablating, instead of destroying, stimulate a specific area of the brain and make them feel different. Amazing. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about robotics, something that's done every day here at the university. And the whole idea behind robotics is twofold, as I look at it. And as guys like Rick Sektava set up training stations throughout the country to train young surgeons how to train, this is one of the best ways to train them, through simulation and through robotics. But it's also a great way to do operations. So you can do operations in very deep holes through very tiny ports, 
okay, this is all endoscopic, and do amazing things with six degrees of freedom. So here are the instruments used in general surgery and urology all the time, used in cardiac surgery for bypasses in some certain centers, and used in neurosurgery, just beginning to be used in neurosurgery, doing operations with robotics. And it helps train doctors. The virtual reality robotic simulators really are very good at making, you know, uh, doctors better surgeons, or at least making sure that they don't make errors. So I'm going to give you an example of um, one of my colleagues at Children's Hospital doing an operation on a kidney, which is in a very, as you know from many medical school, very deep area, okay, of the, uh, of the peritoneum in the belly. And here he is, he's working on the kidney, he's opening it up, it's obstructed, the, the big the big conduit, the big pipe coming out of the kidney is obstructed, and he's cutting it down, and look what he's able to do. Now, he's, not op he's sitting at a robot, and he's doing the operation, and the key is he couldn't do that. He'd have to make a huge incision in the patient to get in there, to get his hands in there to do that. He's doing this all through tiny little ports, through ports the size of maybe uh, a thick pen, and look at this, he's suturing something together just as if he would do, be doing it himself, but the robot's doing all the work through a laparoscopic port. And it's absolutely amazing the precision, he can pass a 6-0 needle, and the precision that that brings to surgery. Now, one of the most exciting things that I think is coming out right now, and it is not ready for prime time, this is the next 10 years, you need to look for it, is this concept of the computer brain interface. And one of the leaders in the country, fortunately, is at our institution, a young man named Jeff Ogeman, um, who brilliant young uh, person who, is, who does epilepsy. So the way he's able to do these, um, these studies is basically he's implanting electrodes to find the epileptic focus in people with epilepsy because he's an epilepsy surgeon who takes out these areas, okay? So I'm gonna give you an example. Here's a patient with those electrodes in their brain, okay? And here they're watching a computer to monitor. Now they're not touching anything. They're not, hands are not on the cursor or anything, but I'm gonna show you with brain waves what they're able to do is will, will the cursor to move to various areas of the screen by doing nothing other than thinking. And basically, we're beginning to understand the electrical code, the mathematic and electrical code in the brain so well that we not only can map where things happen, but we basically can make things happen like this. So here he is. We're, so we're putting up a red, red line, and all the patient is doing is making this dot go to that red line, not touching anything. Basically, his brain is acting like a computer. Yellow line, red line, and this is the electrical activity in the brain that's making it do that. The patient's not sure how it's happening. He knows what he has to do. He's telling his brain to do it, and the electrical activity is making it happen. So what does that mean if we can map the electrical activity in the brain? What does this mean for amputees or people that are missing parts of their body? Look at it. And the patient gets better and better as more and more lines come up. They're able to direct, they're able to direct their cursor with their brain, and they're not quite sure how they're doing it. Amazing, huh? So what's next? Well, I'll tell you what's next is robotics again. Basically, how about the people that lose limbs, such as in a wartime or in a civilian um, tragedy, they'll be able to maybe wire, be wired back to their brain to restore neural function. That's what it's about. Give you an idea. This is from the same place that Dr. Satava works. They're developing, obviously, for obvious reasons. Jeff Ling, who is one of the professors and um, 
and one of the scientists at DARPA is working on a bionic hand. We have some out there, but not ones with the ability to pose the thumb and have six degrees of freedom. And so you can imagine what they're working on is the brain-computer interface with these bionic limbs so that someday they can implant electrodes in the brain and hook them up to the bionic limbs. That's what you will see in the future, the six million dollar man. So does innovation really work? Well, well, let's look at, this was in the New England Journal about a year ago. And it was amazing to me, you know, we hear a lot about the things wrong with medicine and we know about errors and how to prevent errors and why we as physicians need to do better. But we never look at the other side is the miracles that happen every day with this collaboration. So remember I told you in 1900, average person lived 49 years. Average man and woman lives about 76.87 years. And the key is, since 1960, there's almost seven years gained over the last four decades. And it's no longer about clean water or food or infectious diseases. We've made great advances in that. That's what you saw from 1900 to 1960. But what you're seeing now rising, okay, is innovation, is being able to treat cardiac disease better, being able to treat stroke better, being able to treat cancer better. And these are the innovations that are making a difference. Because what, what we always say, it's all about the next generation. It's all about the children. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be back. For those of you who I were here two or three years ago when we came. Uh, welcome back. It's good to see you all again. I have a few new toys, but uh, some of them that you've seen before, so please bear with me. Um, it's always difficult to follow Dr. Ellen Bogan. We always chide each other uh, as to who goes first because the other one ends up having to repeat some of the things they had before, but with a different tone. Um, this is my disclosure. The companies that uh, have been supporting our uh, Innovation Center, uh, the Institute of Surgical and Interventional Simulation, or ISIS Training Center. Um, <clears throat> the disruptive Visions talks about what the future is. And Yogi Berra said it better than anyone else when he said the future is not what it used to be. And that's really a profound statement because what it means really is that the basic assumptions of the way you live your life no longer count. The future is so fundamentally different that things that you thought were true are false things that you thought were false will now become true. And I'll show you some of the reasons that we think so. So, what's happening now? Well, it's the future. It's the information age. What kind of really good future things do we have? For example, total body scanning are available. How many of you have had a total body scan? A few of you. Well, this is really important. Uh, there's a lot of contention about whether or not you should have it because you might find a disease or something. But I would encourage you to have your total body scan as soon as you can while you're healthy, so that when you do get sick, we can compare to what you were like when you were healthy, so that we'll know whether or not the spot that was on there is something you've had for the past 20 or 30 years, we don't have to do anything about it, or if it's something new and really ought to be very, very involved with it. In the future, my prediction is this is what your medical record will look like. It will be a body scan of yourself, it will be you, and we will put all of your data into your image, and it will behave like you. And you can interact with it, you can give it a medicine, and it will change based upon the medicine that you give it. I like it because if you come to me with a disease that needs surgery, I can practice and I make my mistakes on your body before I operate on you. All other professions except for healthcare have an information representation or a computer representation of their product, whether it be a dress, a car, an airplane, or whatever and they test them out, they evaluate them, they practice on them, and they finally build the final product, making the mistakes on the image. This, for the very first time, gives us in healthcare an opportunity to make our mistakes on your image before we try them out on you. We have about 40,000 troops over in Iraq now with electronic dog tags that have their images on them. <clears throat> the robots are coming, the robots are coming, look out, look out, look out. 
Uh, why do we like robots? Well, I'll show you in a minute. But one of the most important discoveries that I was told about was that a robot is not a machine. A robot is an information system of arms or legs or eyes. A CT scanner is not an imaging device. It's an information system with eyes. And when you look at the things that we use in medicine as information systems with, it allows you, therefore, to start to integrate the practice of medicine in ways we've never been able to do it before. In the past, I would look at the x-ray of the patient, try to decide what would need to be done, and then we'd prepare the patient, we'd do the surgery, and I would go between the operating room uh, table and the x-ray machine and try and decide what's going on. And I'd have to operate right there with the patient directly in front of me. Robotic surgery, it's different. I can do everything that I want just by sitting down at the robotic workstation. I can do open surgery. I can do minimally invasive surgery. I can do remote telesurgery. I can bring your image in before I operate and practice on it, like I said. Make the mistakes on the image before I actually do the surgery. Or I can bring the image during surgery, like Dr. Ellen Bogan does, and use it for intraoperative image navigation so that I'm able to see structures that aren't visible to my eye. Or I could even practice and rehearse surgical procedures on it. All from one single place, and that place is the surgical workstation. So it's revolutionizing the way that we can perform our surgery and bringing it together at a single place. So the question is, why do we like robots? What are the robots like that we have today? Well, here's a very simple robot that we have. This is called the Phantom. It comes from MIT. And it's a haptic device that gives us a sense of touch. And then now the robot does itself. Well, I mean, I'm not impressed. I mean, I can do it that well. I, I can do that good, too. Don't feel much thumb. I think a little better. Jonathan. Uh-oh. I think I'm going to have to give me up on that one. This robot can do this 24 hours a day, seven days a week without a single mistake. Way beyond anything that we could do in human yeah. performance. We could do it in so the point is that there are things that robots are okay. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, whoa, I know. Right, yeah. yeah good. Okay. All right. So there are things that robots are good for, and there are things that humans are good for. And we need to learn which ones are going to be best. Um, how about bringing to you the hospital to you instead of you to the hospital? We develop portable intensive care units that allow us to take everything that's in a hospital, put it in a tiny platform that is underneath the stretcher, and actually make it available at the far forward battlefield. And here we are back in the year 2000. We now have about 40 or 50 of these on the battlefield of Iraq and Afghanistan, taking the hospital, if you will, or the intensive care unit to the soldier. The soldier is wounded. They're placed immediately on this platform called the LSTAT. <clears throat> They're flown from the battlefield while the surgeon is taking care of them to the closest airfield, then in the ambulance to the MASH hospital. At the MASH hospital, the surgeon continues to take care of them, decides that they need surgery, takes them to the operating room, operates on them, and when he's finished, takes them to the recovery room. During that entire time, the surgeon had complete control of the patient and was adjusting things as they needed it. And at the same time, a complete medical record was being kept. So we've got the capability now through information systems, whether they be robots or portable intensive care, to once again integrate the care of our patients and keep record of it in ways that we hadn't been before. And as we talked about the battlefield, we know that we've got unmanned air vehicles out there. We're now looking at the next generation of them, and they're the unmanned helicopters, some of which you see here. The military is building them. About 85% of all patients that are brought to a MASH hospital from the battlefield are brought on what we call vehicle of opportunities. There'll be Jeeps, there'll be uh, Deuce and a Half, Humvees, whatever is out there. When somebody is wounded, they grab the closest vehicle and they drive them back to the, the MASH hospital. In the future, we're going to have these unmanned helicopters, which are going to be resupplying the troops out on the far forward area. And they're going to be sitting there. So our anticipation is that we're going to have a combination of the intensive care unit that you saw, plus these unmanned vehicles. And when the, the soldier gets wounded, or maybe out on the highway, you just put them in this intensive care unit, 
put him in the back of this helicopter, press the button, and automatically flies him back to the closest uh, hospital. So why are we looking at these? Because there are many things that are done in other areas, the military and other industries, that we in healthcare really should be taking advantage of. We have a lot of different robots. For example, in the operating room, I have the robot that I operate with, but my nurse changes all of the instruments on it. And another nurse gives me the supplies. If you go to a factory somewhere where we've got the same kind of robots, there are no people allowed there. Instead of having a scrub nurse, they've got a tool changer. And instead of having a circulating nurse for new supplies, they have parts dispenser. So well, why don't we have that? So we decided we were going to try to build this. And here is a model, if you will, the CAD CAM model, the actual design of the parts. And the way that they designed the system was here is the robot that the surgeon uses on your left, the da Vinci, uh, just the arms of it. Here is our scrub nurse, and here's our other part of the scrub nurse for the tool changing, and here's the circulating nurse for the parts dispenser. And the scrub nurse would reach over, grab a tool, change the tool on the robot, and then go get a part and provide it to the surgeon where he would be able to take it out. And when he was finished, they would be able to put the tray back. Well, that looks good in a cartoon. How far have we gotten? Well, here is that same exact system. There is the Da Vinci robot on the left, scrub nurse in the middle, the circulating nurse or the parts dispenser on the right. And you see that the surgeon has requested a supply. The robotic arm has gone over, reached over there, and picked out a tray. There are 210 different trays in that part dispenser and is able to present them to the surgeon. When they're finished, they put them in the trash or on the mail stand. And then the surgeon, by a verbal request, asks for a new instrument, and the robot reaches over <clears throat> to the tool changer, grabs a new instrument from them. The surgeon then puts his uh, robotic arm into neutral, and the scrub nurse takes the old instrument out of the robotic arm, replaces it with the new instrument, and then takes the old instrument and puts it back in the tool changer. Incidentally, the rate of this has been slowed down to one-fifth speed so we can follow this. Actually, it is able to do this tool changing five times faster than what you can see here. <clears throat> a nurse will be able to change an instrument in 17 seconds. This system changes it in seven. Its efficiency is 99.97%. I don't mean to imply that we're going to be getting rid of our scrub nurses. What I mean to imply is that we're going to be able to relieve them of the simple repetitive tasks, like you saw in that first one. Uh, where we had the nurse able to go ahead and put between there. This is a pick and place. And all other industries of healthcare are using robotic systems to do that. And so this is going to free our nurses up to do more intellectually challenging procedures. So the question came was, why in the world was the military interested in this? Well, I showed you about all the robots that we have out in the battlefield. And so we decided if there's going to be all those robots out in the battlefield, how would we develop a system that would complement that for medical support. In position. So these are the soldiers in, in an urban environment, Iran. Man down, man down. Soldiers Medivac. wounded. Medivac. Uh, we have about 9,000 robots on the battlefield today, in case you didn't know. Some of them are ground robots and some of them are flying robots. That is the automatic casualty extracting vehicle that is able to scoop up an individual. We have two of those in training exercises today. Put them in the back of an armored ambulance, and we'll be putting in the back of the armored ambulance a scanning machine as well as robotic arms. We'll scan to find out where the injury is and compare it to what they were like when they were normal. Then start an IV automatically with the robotic arm. Then the surgeon will begin operating. We'll be able to change tools, the tool changers that I showed you there. Use some other supplies or fiber and glue or some others, and in addition to using mechanical instruments, we can use energy such as high intensity focused ultrasound that you've heard of, or lasers. And then when the surgical procedure is finished, we're able to call in the closest medevac helicopter and automatically evacuate them from the battlefield. Now the reason that we put this video together was to show you that everything that's on that video we have available today. We don't have to invent anything. It's simply a matter of putting these systems together and integrating them in a way that it will be useful for us. So am I telling you that we're getting rid of all of our surgeons and replacing them with robots? Well, probably not. But a lot of people have been comparing, say, surgeons to fighter pilots. And what's been going on in the fighter pilot field? Well, on the left-hand side, you see here the fighter pilot of 2002, king of the air. And in 2003 came Predator. 
this unmanned vehicle that just kind of flies around for surveillance, and then for hunter-seeker, looking for specific targets, and finally hunter-killer. The United States military in the year 2000 spent $220 billion for the Joint Airstrike Fighter. And that is the last fighter aircraft our military will ever buy that has a pilot in it. By the year 2025, there will be no piloted vehicles in the far forward battlefield. Every one of them will be replaced by unmanned combat air vehicles. So if we're going to be able to replace our pilots, what about our surgeons? As a matter of fact, the training has gone forward that the Air Force has begun a new school for training pilots that will never, ever get into an aircraft. They will be our Nintendo pilots, if you will, remotely flying the aircraft uh, out on the battlefield. So, but maybe we'll have to look for other opportunities. <laughs> so, well, I showed you what we have here, and I'm going to spend a few minutes telling you what the future might look like, because in my view, that's pretty much the present, what we can do and what we may be able to do. And if we are in the information age, the information age can't be the future, because you can't be both the future and the present at the same time. So something else has to be the future. The question is exactly what are these incredible new discoveries that are going to be coming out there? Well, in the laboratory, we've got a lot of very interesting things. For example, this little bumblebee on his back has a sensor, which happens to be sensitive to anthrax, and a little transmitter. And what the military did with this is they had a training exercise in the good guys and the bad guys. They sent the bad guys out and gave them some simulated biological agents like anthrax. And the good guys went after them. Bad guys released the simulant. Good guys released all of their bumblebees, and they went flying around the battlefield. Some of them flew through the biological agent, knew exactly where it was, and sent that information back to the soldiers, and they were able to get around them and not be contaminated by the biological agent. So we were able to detect things using a combination of living and engineering systems that we couldn't do either way alone, combining living and non-living systems. Ah, cockroach. I hate cockroaches. This is uh, Bob Fuller's experiment with the cockroaches, with the tiny probes in their brain. Bob Fuller was a roboticist, and he was trying to understand how he can optimize the motion in robots. The most efficient motion machine on the planet happens to be a cockroach. It can run faster, it can carry more for its weight, so on and so forth. They're extraordinarily efficient. And during the time that they were studying them, one night the students went back to the lab and they disconnected the wire from the brain to the computer at the computer and hooked it up to a joystick and started driving this cockroach around the laboratory. Three and a half million dollars to drive a cockroach around the laboratory. <laughs> I was beginning to get a little bit worried, but, but think about it. Think about your cell phone. You've got these tiny little cameras. If we put a camera on the back of this cockroach, and took it to some place like um, the earthquake in Pakistan or maybe the World Trade Center, it could go places that even humans or dogs can't go. We probably could have saved thousands of lives if we had had something like that available at this time. Maybe it wasn't so stupid after all. We have intelligent prostheses. The soldier that you see here in the middle is the first of a number of soldiers who have decided to uh, not accept their retirement for the military after they lost their leg and have retrained and gone back and joined the unit for a second tour over there. They are, the prostheses that we have now are so good that we can make people full combat ready or we can make them full sports ready. So our prosthesis, replacing parts that we have lost, is getting better and better. And a number of uh, institutions are doing tissue engineering, growing new tissues, growing new organs. Um, Jay Vicanti has been able to grow a new liver. Uh, in uh, Wake Forest, Dr. Tony Atala has his five-year follow-up on uh, patients that had bladder cancer that he removed the entire bladder, grew a brand new bladder from their own stem cells, put it back into them, and at the end of five years it was a perfectly functioning normal bladder. And because it was grown with their own stem cells, they didn't have to use any immunosuppression. Uh, so the transplant can be done without any serious chemotherapeutic agents. Uh, I'm a little bit afraid about this because what this means, I do a lot of operations, particularly on the stomach. I love the stomach. I have 23 operations I know how to do on the stomach. Whether you've got cancer, you've got ulcers, you've got bleeding. You, no man, I got, a, I got an operation for you. However, <laughs> now that we've got the opportunity to start growing new organs, what am I going to have? One operation. No matter what's wrong with you, I will take out your stomach 
and give you a brand new one with your own stem cells. Think about it. Nobody, except people in, in medicine now, fix anything anymore. You always get a new one. Take your car in. They don't fix it. They don't repair it. They take out the old part and give you a brand new one. So it's time for us, and now that we've got the technologies, to follow suit. And I wouldn't be surprised within the decade we're going to see more and more of these artificial organs being grown and replaced. Uh, this is the orb spider. It makes the strongest known natural fiber on this planet. And the genetic sequence of that was discovered by Nexia Technology. They clipped it out and they put it into some goats. And now they have herds of goats whose milk contains the protein that makes this fiber. They've got literally unlimited quantities of the strongest known fiber on this planet, just from the milk of goats. So what we are looking at with genetic engineering and transgenetic engineering is going to different species, whether they be plant or animals, and actually having them build and manufacture things for us. Perhaps in the future, factories will not be made out of bricks, mortar, and smokestacks, but will be herds of animals or fields and plants that are actually able to grow the things that we want rather than manufacture them. I'll come back to these in a minute. And finally, right here, um, in, in the Whammy region up in Alaska, Brian Barnes was one of the first to discover that animals do not hibernate because it's cold. Animals hibernate because they turn themselves off. Somewhere deep in the brain, in the hypothalamus, a molecule is uh, excreted. We don't know what the stimulus is, but it goes out throughout the body, and it lands right on the little mitochondria, right between the NAD and the acetylcoenzyme A, where the oxygen is supposed to be, and it prevents the oxygen from transferring its electrons. And when that happens, there's no energy for the cell, and the animal goes into hibernation or suspended animation. And you see here some of the signs and some of the signals that we have from the animal experiments that Brian Barnes was doing. Here at the Hutch, uh, Mark Roth has been looking at that and has discovered that he can substitute hydrogen sulfide for oxygen in the mice that he's working with. And what that does now is that the, instead of breathing oxygen, they breathe small quantity of, uh, of hydrogen sulfide, and that sticks in there on the mitochondria, and it prevents the electrons from flowing. And I said, well, gee, that's great. Uh, Mark, but why would you want to do that? And he countered with a question. He said, what is the most energetic thing that you will ever do in your life? Now, the most energetic thing that you're ever going to do is you're going to die. Because just before you die, the act of dying is you literally activate nearly every system in an attempt to save yourself. And that requires an enormous amount of energy. So he said, if we go ahead and use this hydrogen sulfide, and we actually block the electrons for flowing, there's going to be no energy. You're not going to be able to die. You're not going to be alive, but you can't die unless you violate the laws of physics. And that's, he says, what the definition of suspended animation is. And to prove that, he's got mice that he has used, and he's had them in this state of suspended animation for about six hours. They have no pulse. They have no breathing. Their temperature assumes the ambient temperature around them. Uh, they have no EKG, no brain signals. If you put them in MRI scan, there's no evidence of activity whatsoever. Six hours later, he removes all this hydrogen sulfide gas, gives them oxygen back. They wake up. They run around. They run through the maze. They feed themselves and so forth. So we have all evidence that they have perfectly normal activity. So we now have mice in the laboratory that can actually live for, I mean, can be in suspended animation for six hours, meeting all criteria of death, and then reviving them, having them perfectly normal. So, oh my gosh, where did that come from? They always get in there, I'm fine. So, um, I will conclude in the last two or three minutes by saying, well, so what? We've got a lot of technologies. Technology is moving fast, but it's moving so fast that we, on the social sciences, the behavioral side, and the moral and ethical issues cannot keep up with them. So what are some of these technologies that we have to worry about? The first one that struck us, of course, was cloning and human cloning. And there was the announcement that, gee whiz, we've got the very first human clone, and nine months later there was. Now, it doesn't matter if you believe that. We now have three countries around the world that have government-sponsored human cloning, China, Korea, and Switzerland. Why China does, I really don't know. They've probably got enough people. But they're doing human cloning at Space Honor, if you will. And what was the response to that? It was a political knee-jerk in which absolutely all countries were forbidden to do cloning except for those three. 
That is not a responsible way because people are going to continue scientific endeavors. They're not going to stop. And so the question is, how can we respond appropriately? And what are some of the technologies that we need to be thinking about that are right at our back doorstep now? If you're not aware of it, the first genetically engineered child was born in 2003. Uh, an advanced in vivo fertilization technique was used and actually genetically engineered this child, this girl, to have blonde hair, blue eyes, and another characteristics that were chosen by the family. Now remember I told you about that spider and the goats. You can take genes from one to another. We have to know that the pit viper snake is able to see and seek its prey by using infrared vision. And we know that the hummingbird finds its flowers by looking at the ultraviolet. We have four rhodopsin, which is the chemicals that we use to see, but we only use two of them. But we have all four of them. We haven't activated the two that the hummingbird or the pit viper use. So what would happen if we would take your granddaughter and give her those genes? Now she can see at night. No one else can. What incredible opportunities would she have? I don't know. Longevity. We have at least three different types of mice out there that can live the equivalent of two to three times a normal lifespan, whether it be manipulating apoptosis, uh, the telomerase action, uh, glycemic index, and so forth. There are a number of different mechanisms to do that. The question would be now, if we gave your son, as he was born, this genetic manipulation with the anti-telomerase and apoptosis, now he is going to live 200 to 250 years. Going to retire at age 55 and collect a pension? <laughs> what are you going to do for 200 and 250 years? Can we afford to have people living that long? Are we going to have enough food for them? Are we going to overpopulate the planet even further? I've showed you a number of the different technologies out there to replace body parts. We can grow new organs. We can have very intelligent prostheses. About, at this time, we believe about 95% of your body can be replaced with artificial organs of one kind or another. So my question to you is, if I replace 95% of your body, what makes you human? Is it this flesh and blood that you were born with? Will you still be human if you're all replaced with other tissues or parts? I don't know. So I tried to show you the implications of the technologies that are coming in the laboratory and coming out within the next one or two decades. And I'll close with a paraphrase from Francis Fukuyama from the President's Commission on Biomedical Ethics in his book, what he called Our Post-Human Future. And it goes something like this. For the first time in history, there walks upon this planet a species so powerful that it can control its own evolution by its own time, its own choosing. That species is Homo sapiens. Ladies and gentlemen, what will you choose to make as our next species? Thank you very much.